What do diamond and graphite have in common? If you guess that they're both made of carbon, you're correct. This unique idea that one element can have two different structures are called allotropes. Now, we've come across allotropes a little bit before when we looked at some covalently bonded compounds. For instance, oxygen comes in a couple of different allotropes. It can exist as O2, oxygen gas, or O3, ozone, each with its unique structure. Carbon also exhibits this property, and it has several different allotropes. In this program, we're going to look at diamond, graphite, graphene, and C60 fullerene. Now, the first three allotropes that I've mentioned here, the diamond, the graphite, and the graphene, form what we call covalent network solids. That means they don't have any definitive formula beyond that they contain, in this case, carbon, but the number of carbons can essentially stretch on into the thousands, as for instance here in the picture of graphene, this particular molecule can stretch to the left or right or up or down and have countless numbers of carbon atoms contained in it. That's different than my fullerene. My fullerene is actually a molecule which contains 60 carbons, a fixed number. So network solids can contain a variable number, which is usually quite large, and a molecular solid has a fixed number. Let's start off by taking a look at the properties of diamond. Here I have a microscopic view or sketch of at least what they think diamond looks like. All carbon atoms connected covalently to each other, so every single carbon is connected covalently to four others. On the surface of the diamond, the, since there aren't any carbons any longer available, those carbons, in order to complete and get a stable octet, will often hook up to hydrogen. So if we consider the carbon here shown at the very top, that would need three more hydrogens to bond it to because it's only bonded to one carbon. And here the carbon over on the left side, since it's bonded to two carbons, would require two hydrogens to complete their octets. So the surface of diamond is actually a very thin layer of hydrogen, but internally it's all carbon covalently bonded to carbon. Now, these covalent bonds are quite strong. As a result, it leads to the fact that diamond's quite hard and has a very high melting point. Every single bond has a locked pair of electrons in the covalent bond, all arranged in the tetrahedral structure. As I mentioned, the covalent bond is formed by a sharing of valence electrons. Those valence electrons are locked into that place and not free to move, which is one of our conditions that's necessary to conduct electricity. So as a result, diamond is a very poor conductor. Let's take a look now at graphite. Graphite, first of all, contains layers of carbon atoms. Each of these carbon atoms is bonded to three others, not four as in diamond. And as a result, it has a different shape. It forms these flat hexagonal rings. Each carbon being bonded to three others has one valence electron that's not bonded. That unbonded electron is free to form double bonds and therefore form a stable octet by moving around. So for instance, I could form a double bond here to complete the octet of the central carbon, or that could form a double bond here, or likewise with the one at the bottom. So that one electron is free to move around, and that leads to the conductivity of graphite, at least across the sheets. These layers are held together by a weak intermolecular bond called the London force. So when this substance breaks, it breaks usually the London force because that's weaker, not the covalent bond. So for instance, when you write with your pencil, you're not breaking the covalent bonds in the sheets of carbon. You're breaking the weak London force that exists between the sheets. So as you move your pencil across the sheet of paper, you're leaving down sheets of carbon atoms on the paper as you write. If these sheets are all joined together, we form what's called graphene, a single monolayer of, of carbon. This substance doesn't have the London dispersion force as it's just one sheet, and as a result, it doesn't share that property with graphite. It's not brittle, but rather quite flexible. Otherwise, it does share the similar properties of conductivity. C60 fullerene. Fullerenes are a class of compounds, or group of compounds. I'm gonna look specifically at C60, but there are other variations. There's C70, C50, C48, but we're gonna focus on C60, the first fullerene to be identified. First of all, it's a spherical arrangement of carbon in which there are 60 carbon atoms. 
12 pentagons, 20 hexagons. Again, each of our carbon atoms is bonded to three others. That leaves that free electron to move around and therefore conduct electricity within the sphere itself. It does have a difficulty though with that electron moving from one sphere to the other. And as a result, it's a semiconductor, not as good as graphene or graphite. Also recall that this is a molecule. It's small in size compared to the other structures we've looked like. And this particular substance is soluble not in water, but in things like hexene and benzene, nonpolar solvents. I'm going to mention at this point quartz. Now quartz is not an allotrope of carbon, but it does share something in common with diamond in that it's another example of a giant covalent network solid. Here you can see a picture of the starting of its arrangement over here on the left. In this particular molecule, every silicon shown here as sort of a tan colored atom is connected to four oxygen atoms in a tetrahedral like arrangement. If you look inside the structure and count the number of silicons and the number of oxygens, there exists a one to two ratio. And that's why we give it the formula SiO2. Again, much like diamonds, since all of the electrons are tied up in those covalent bonds and not free to move, silicon dioxide is a very poor conductor of electricity. Because the bonds are all covalent, it's very high melting and also not very soluble. So that serves as an introduction to allotropes and a little bit about covalent network solids. We have one more program to look at in covalent compounds, and that has to do with the intermolecular forces, which we'll come back and visit the London force. Again, please post any questions, and thanks for watching.